Happy Sabbath and welcome to Study 7, the Sabbath School Lesson Review Podcast, which is going to be hosted by young people from the East Caribbean Conference. My name is Chelsea and I'm joined tonight by probably two familiar faces, depending on which part of the island you are from, but I'll let them introduce themselves nevertheless. Hey everyone, my name is Luen, as most of you probably know. Okay. And less familiar, Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> So, as you guys know, over the next few weeks, we'll be bringing to you this lesson in a real practical way that we as young people can actually relate to, and some of the older people as well, um, instead of just reading it through the pages, actually bringing it to life and bringing meaning to it. So, our aim, really, and foremost, is to study seven. That's the whole name of the thing, study seven. So, we want you to study your lesson seven days a week, and most importantly, see how each day you can apply it to your life. So, we're going to be looking forward to seeing you every every Friday night over this next quarter. So to start us off, as you know, we're in quarter two already. The year is running fast and the lesson is entitled Three Cosmic Messages. And of course, if you're Adventist, you already know this looks at the three angels' messages, which is typically found in Revelations. And this forms a central part of our Adventist church's mission to prepare the world for the second coming. So this week, we're going to be looking at lesson number one, which is Jesus wins, Satan loses. And if you had a look at the lesson already, it really tells you how it all began and most importantly, how it all ends. So it's like reading a book, but already knowing how the story will play out. So before we get into the discussion, let's just pause and have a word of prayer. Luen, you want to pray for us? Yeah, that's fine. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come tonight where we could discuss the lesson that you would have aided in preparing. I pray that those of us who are watching tonight or those of us who would have read it over the week, what I've been impacted by the words that would have been written so that we can apply it to our lives. This is our this is my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So memory text time. Anybody memorized it? No, but I can read it for you. <laughs> um, Revelation 12, 17. And it says, And the and the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Fancy words, fancy words. And as an Adventist, growing up in Adventist church, because I grew up in the Adventist church, I assume all of us grew up in Adventist church. This is a familiar text, but hopefully by the end of this lesson, everybody will be able to understand the metaphors and the symbols that are used throughout the text. So the lesson starts off um, talking about this cosmic battlefield, which as we all studied, is this ongoing conflict between good and evil. And having grown up in the Adventist church, we're used to terms like the three angels message and this cosmic battle. And as Lewin just read, things like the dragon and the woman, and all of this imagery and this symbolism. But I mean, if you were to give this to a non-Adventist and you had to make sense of it, like, how would you do that? Because otherwise, it really does just sound like a scene from an Avengers movie. Where it's like, you know, this big battle, good and evil, you can't see the forces, etc. So... How do we take a step back and how do we explain how we really just got here to this cosmic battle, especially to someone not of our faith? All right, truth is, I, while reading it, it it's almost more like a, a, a scene from Game of Thrones, like with the dragons, you know? I, um, I, 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 was I would Thrones, not. So. We did not give in to that temptation. <clears throat> oh, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> I saw the trailers just like, oh, yeah, sure, okay. right? Sure, okay. But um, essentially, it started out with a war in heaven. Like, this perfect place which is kind of a oxymoron yeah you know um had a war taking place in it and then satan and like jesus had a little fall you know you know and as a result satan kind of took a one third of the angels um to follow him that, that, that already sounds a little falling out that's, yeah. like a big, that's like a pretty big falling out fair enough <laughs> and as a result nowhere in this position where satan and jesus even though not in the same place as in, in heaven. Satan and Jesus, although not still in the same place which was heaven, they're still fighting. And the battle now is pretty much for our soul salvation. Uh, words that we hear, that we hear said cliche um, at church all the time, but that's pretty much what it boils down to. Two people who probably used to be friends, you know, jealousy like you and that girl, and then to wanna follow, <laughs> to wanna follow, and no, the got a big fight. But the question, Simple. the question, the real question is, how we get to this falling out? If the relationship was it's so good, perfect. if this if this relationship was so good, how how we get to this falling out? 
Um, it's like... But not just the relationship before yeah. you start. I mean, mm -hmm. like, the place, heaven. When, you th when we even think about heaven now and going to heaven, is this idea of perfection where, you know, there be none of all of this, what we're talking about. We're, we're saying that we're here today because of something that started in this perfect place. So Was it really perfect? Well, that's a question that I often ask myself all the time. How could something that affects us so greatly today that is negative um, have origins in this perfect place? Was it really perfect? Well, I believe all God's um, creation was perfect, mm. but he gave us the power of choice. He also gave the angels the power of choice. Mm. And giving us the power of choice, that means we can choose him or not choose him. And essentially, Satan or, or Lucifer, as he was in heaven, chose himself. He wanted to set himself up to be like God, plant his throne above the throne of God and stuff like that. And essentially, God threw him out. Yeah, so that was what pretty much happened in a nutshell. Like, yes, having this perfect place has had um, beings in it. Lucifer, who was an angel, was one of them. Um, he was pretty close to God. I guess as a result of seeing the things that God had command and power over. I mean, Lucifer probably tell yourself, you know, man. Why, why not me? I want to say it too, you know, like, I tired of being the supervisor, I want to be the manager now. And as a result of that, like... I mean, he was, you know? I guess, one of the first examples, and I came out in last quarter too, of like covetousness. So he was there, you know, he his needs and stuff were being supplied, he was close, he was with the father, but it's like, I want to be, as you said, top dog. Which, as we know today, is you see things and you covet it and you want it and it became I, 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 rather than, you know, thank you, God, for this privilege I have to even be this close to you or whatever the case may be. And I think that's where we first see it seeping in. And I think what the lesson brought out that was really good is that God's government is built on choice, which is what Jerome said earlier, but both in heaven and in earth. So yes, heaven was a perfect place, but one of the common factors between the two is that Everybody had a choice. And I think last summer, I saw a lot later as well, too, in the week, when they said, because God wanted the response to come from love, love can only exist if there's a choice. So imagine if he just said, no, you just built to love me. And the angels and, and us. It's like a dictatorship. And it's like, you never know if these people really um, chose you. <coughs> so there was even this answer saying, every angel in heaven was faced with the choice either to respond to God's love or to turn away selfishness, arrogance, and pride, which you see Lucifer and his third did. So just as the heavenly angels are confronted by love with an eternal choice, Revelation presents each one of us with eternal choices in Earth's final conflict. So that also brings us to the fore. We have the same choice that was presented in heaven, but we're no active agents in this war. We didn't per se start it. It started long before us, but now we're very active on a battlefield, which it doesn't feel that way, but we are. So then, if we are, whose side are we on? Can we be neutral in our lifestyle or, like... So, first of all, before we get to that point, just to be clear, heaven was a perfect place. But as a result of the ability to choose, they had the ability to choose something that wasn't good. Right? And that's kind of what Satan would have done. Hence, the, 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 the fight that occurred in heaven between... Satan and Jesus. Yeah. Mm. Um, regarding neutrality, can we really be neutral? My answer is no. Um, I think I think I used this example last time. So like regarding your health, uh, exercising, I think. Is it that you train to have a healthy body or you aren't? Your actions dictate exactly. which which side you go on. So it's either you're gonna eat ice cream every day and pizza and chafet. And let me not say chef at it doesn't say it twice <laughs> but you can eat pizza and fast food and corn curls and red fruity red fruity that's my favorite every day um or are you gonna buy apples and drink a lot of water and exercise and go to the gym like Chelsea yeah but there's, does. There's, there's something wrong with a, a couple cheat days during the week i was gonna say well, a few cheat days you know a few cheat, cheat days day right or one cheat day here and there then. ultimately what is your goal and ultimately, what do the actions that you take suggest that your goal is? True. Because at any day, is either you gonna be healthy or you won't be healthy. True. There's no neutrality. And that's my position on it. 
Um, so you guys don't hear us. So we should constantly be striving towards this more. It's not striving towards it, stepping back a bit, stepping to the side a bit. It should be forward motion all the time. And the Bible essentially say that they, they can't be any uh, middle ground. Um, in Revelations, you know, remember it talks about being lukewarm. God says, I could work with you if you hot or if you cold, I could heat you up. But if you lukewarm, I don't really know where you're supposed to be, so I'll spew you also my mouth. I mean, practically, like, I understand. I agree, like, in being neutral in a sense, you kind of made your choice as well, too, in a sense. Being neutral is a choice. Like, being neutral is a no. choice, being neutral but it says something. Choice. So it's like, you know when someone says, I didn't get an answer from any person, and someone says, well, silence in itself is an answer. That was what I mean from that concept. But why I was... So I want to talk about two things. What neutrality I was thinking could possibly look like, but it might not be neutrality. It might just be us actually being on the other side. And then, like, why I don't think neutrality can exist. So the first thing is, like, you know, being practical. This warfare is happening consistently. All the time. We talk about the big one in Revelation, the big final showdown stuff. But remember, there's a lot of individual warfares for our individual souls. So we will have our own individual battles. You know, yourself, Jaron, myself, and the devil is crafty in his ways to, to win each of us. So my thing is, imagine I'm going to church every Sabbath, got different positions, whatever, doing this <coughs> podcast, making time, doing my devotion. And I just, you know, every now and then... I might listen to something like, you know when Super Bowl come on and you went on and you listen to Rihanna or something like that. Mm. Like, is that a case of, you know, here and there you're just, as you said, a cheat day, but you don't think it's too bad. So it's like, you know, here and here, and you kind of trying to justify it. To me, like, I feel like we subconsciously make those neutral-ish choices, which in essence we've heard over and over, you can't got one for in, you can't got one for out. I want to say Sin, uh, me sin is sin. I, I don't know. I don't know how you could be in the middle. Sin, I, I'm sin not saying. I'm just saying. Like sometimes we may see it as I agree with what you're saying, but I'm saying we may see it practically in our lives as neutrality, or we may not be so concerned. Like while we're actually being um, like this lukewarm or, or choosing the other side, because it's just so like it seems so harmless. All right. So since you're keeping it real on the podcast, right? I watched the same Super Bowl performance with Rihanna, but ultimately I can say this no. Like, there's no middle ground. So, was watching Rihanna's performance in support of something that Jesus would want? Exactly. Or was it not? Like, a lot of people keep telling you that I black and white, right? For them, um, looking at me, I'm pretty sure that I black. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it's as simple as that. It, it, we make it difficult because we want to do particular we things. So, we, we try to justify our, yeah, the neutrality. But but that's what I'm saying. So I'm but then what my second point then to say like, you know, we try to justify it, but it's still wrong, is if we put ourselves you no know, in, in God's shoes or we put it as us. So we got on this battlefield and you got friends, right? Who say, Yeah, I for you, I for you. And but you see their actions and they're like, Yeah, so nice for you, and then sometimes they're talking to the person you're supposed to be going to battle against, and it's like, would you really want to go out there with that person? So like you could see the same verse drawn right about lukewarm. You if you put yourself in that position, it's like I just don't, like, just pick a side. You, you really aren't, you're saying neutral, but really it's like, I really am not going forward or to battle with you. Exactly. So, and then I had, like, these verses that came up, the ones you always hear, choose you, choose this day whom you will serve, you know, but for me, it's my family will serve the Lord. Um, and then it, that was Joshua 24, 15. And then in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, it said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Um, and I think it just reflects that if we be realistic, nobody wants somebody with them or, or defending them who's lukewarm or who's neutral. Because I, I, I ain't know you can switch up on me. So at the end of the day, it really boils down to this, boils down to this whole idea of true belief. Are we truly for God? Are we truly, uh, do we truly believe what it is that we are mm. preaching, what it is we are saying? If we are, or if we do truly believe, then this it would be impossible for us to be, to be neutral. I think... And let's not spend too much time on this, but I think we want to be on a particular side. Like, as church people, as Adventists, we want to be, not everybody, but generally, you know, we want to be on the large side. But then I realize a lot of times when it comes to the actions and things that we display, it kind of says other speaks, speaks yeah. the other side, yeah. Um, the lukewarmness, 
That's not a word. I don't know what else to say, but you don't get the concept I try to the warmity. <laughs> we got Google that one. <laughs> but the the state of being lukewarm, based on what Luen sees, is more common than not. Yeah. We say that we want to be hot. We act as though we want to be hot. But the water lukewarm. So so what does it take to get us to that hot stage? I think, I honestly think it's true belief. I honestly, I always say I feel it's like a belief problem. Because if we truly believe this thing and we truly study, I think it's belief and awareness. Because you could truly believe, but you could not be studying the word consistently. You could not be um, looking at a prophecy. You could not be looking at revelation. If you truly believe and you truly have been reading and studying and you realize this battle is ongoing, you will have such an urgency, not only to put your life in order, like you won't be playing certain things, you won't be even trying to what justify certain it? things. The battle for your soul salvation, the battle between good and evil. Deciding whose side you'll be on at the end of the day. I think if we truly believe that we have such an urgency to put our lives right, but not only that, to spread the message out there. If you really believe something like, like you know how people go around and they really believe there's the best leader, and they go on a campaign, like, it's like, you know, you've got to vote for this body because da 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 they rattle it off. Are we really out there, like, you got to think because this thing is real and this is how it ends. Like it's not like a like with a campaign. You don't know who's gonna end any vote, who's gonna win and who can actually be good, who can be bad. But it's like you got the actual answer here. This is what's gonna happen. This is the finale. I'm not. This is not a hidden thing. So is it really a choice for you to be even thinking, man? Who side should I go on? Like you already know who you losing. Know the end of the story. So um, <coughs> choose the right side. I feel like the conference didn't cancel me after this, but you see, I was saying enthusiasm. I think that you just mentioned regarding like somebody that you fully support and the, the efforts that you will go you would display to make sure the mm-hmm. person is successful, etc. Like I think that's what we lack as Adventists. If we used to support people like how people support Trump. <laughs> no. If we used to um <laughs> um really put Jesus at the forefront to help people to support Trump. Or support any political figure, as a matter of fact. Fine, or my man, I don't come back there the other day, right? Like, so many people would want to hear Be a about part this. of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, they ain't going to twist about it. You, you, showing, you showing, like, extreme enthusiasm for a particular um, effort. Like, people can look at you and be like... And as, as Chelsea you know, said, this, this enthusiasm really comes through belief. If you really believe this thing is true, then you'll be excited about it. You'll want to tell other people about it so that they could be a part of it too. So many things there's always be like, you really believe that? That's or, the thing. Or, it's, it's a belief thing. It's a belief thing. Or we just feel good to say and dress and be close on the Sabbath. And you if you that? believe it too, not only will you be telling them, your life will be showing them. So like how you said, you know, like your lives as well is your biggest testimony. So I think so. So I guess like bringing this back then to summarize how it all began and the whole origin story, which the lesson would have pointed to in Revelation 12, 4 to 6, um, it more or less spoke to this idea of, well, I'll just read it straight forward. It said, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So so break that down. Break that down for us. Yeah, that that, that was a lot to do. Yes, it was a lot, but I feel like like we we kind of, we spoke... Okay, it does not sound like Game of Thrones. I don't even know what Game of Thrones (laughs) sounds like. But the point is, like, it was all of what we were discussing. So there was heaven. In heaven, God created heaven perfect, but individuals... Angels who were in heaven, they had a choice. God's government is not a dictatorship, it's based on choice. So um, Lucifer, who was up there, he had a choice. He didn't choose to, you know, stand to love God. He turned away. He was filled with, you know, selfishness, um, covetousness, all of these things causing him to say, I, I, I want to be greater than God. I want to do this, except etc. As a result, you know, his choice caused him to respond to God's love in a way of selfishness, anger, and he was cast out. He was thrown out of heaven. Him and others. Him, and uh, the, that's why I get into it. No, I said his tail, because you know he's being described as a dragon. So that's Lucifer being thrown out. His tail through a third of the stars of heaven. A third of the stars represents the third of the fallen angels. angels. Yeah. That went with him, because again, yeah. the angels too had a choice. So it wasn't like a case like, oh, um, we just sending out Lucifer. Y'all see what happened there. Nobody else going. It was like, you know, 
who is a choice. It's yeah. fundamentally a government, a choice. So a third went with him. And then it spoke about this idea of the woman, uh, which we're going to get to later, but more or less for context, represents God's church, um, more or less us. And then the male child, which is Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. Um, and then I think the last big thing in there was also speaking about the rod of iron, which is a symbol for rulership. But the fact I was rod of iron, iron is supposed to be unbreakable, all powerful, invincible. So that speaks to the fact that the male child who holds this rod of iron, which is Jesus, you know, he has an unbreakable, all powerful, invincible rulership, which is one of the key components of this whole story. That's why I said, like, we already know who's going to win. It says so in the text. His, his, um, his rulership is unbreakable. He's already defeated the devil. So that's kind of like a summary or a snapshot. It's a very quick overview of what's happened and I guess where we are. But, and we touched on it, we already know how the battle will end. Does that like change your position on? I don't know if it changes your position because you know who's going to win, but does it change your urgency to get out there and either spread the word or to even like change your own life? Like just know who will win. Like, how does that make you feel? I guess, in a sense, growing up in the church, it sort of made you, in a sense, used to these messages already. So my thing is, is about, and I guess I'm glad for this lesson because it should sort of revitalize you, encourage you to mm -hmm. go back out there, reevaluate, reevaluate your life, and and essentially do better. Mm -hmm. Act as though, you know, that you want to be on the winning side. Do you think we take for granted the fact that we know how the battle will end? I think at this point, it, it might be like a fairy tale. Mm. Um, yeah, we keep hearing that Jesus is going to win. Okay, cool. And Jesus is coming again soon. Yeah, he's coming again soon. He going to win the battle. All right, great. But as we were talking about, like, I don't think that, that really motivates us mm -hmm. to want to get other people into, into, the, into this winning team as well. You understand? Know because mm -hmm. ultimately, if we say Jesus is going to win, there got some repercussions that can come along with that for those who are not on his side. Mm -hmm. Which would mean that we should see it very important that I see it very urgent. Yeah, mm -hmm. persons who that persons who aren't on that side, like we try to get them on board because like I care for you. I want you to I want you to be on this winning side too, you know. Um, but that don't happen. So at uh, this point, I think it's like a fairy tale. But as the thing, we can't sell it as a fairy tale. You have to sell it as. This truth. is fundamentally the truth. This is what's happening. And relate it to people's lives. Yes, there's, as I keep saying, there's this big um, cosmic battle happening. But we have one every day for our own soul. So it might be a case, I wake up today and I had my own battle to choose good and evil. Sometimes it might be right in front of me that I can obviously see, well, Chelsea, this is wrong. Don't do that. And you think, but it might be little subconscious things that first you start off, oh, you know, oh, this one matter. Then if you know, a slippery slope. And then it's like, wow, Chelsea, you look back and you're like, Look how easy I switch sides without even really knowing. So I think it's like to break it down to people and make it real on their level. How, it, how does this cosmic battle relate to me? How does it relate to you? Don't just come and, you know, put it out there like, yeah, you know, um, this principality is dark and stuff. Yes, there is. Um, and they're attacking us as well so, in real so ways. I guess the, the whole thing is now taking it from a, a concept of it being Jesus's victory to it being an our victory as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So moving past it just being Jesus, Jesus rose again, he defeated death and he defeated Satan and stuff like that. And also accepting as our victory, we have won the victory over sin as well. Mm -hmm. and, and living as though we've, we've won this victory. Living so we that way no. Yeah, exactly. Living, living, living that way no, so we don't mm -hmm. fall victim to, to temptations all the time. I would say, um, I don't feel like you answered the question you asked it just now. How does knowing how the battle will end change my position? Like, knowing how it will end, I think that I am more willing to go to greater lengths to do things for God that would help bring other persons onto his side. Like, at the end of the day, like, truthfully, uh, is be like, you could choose your position of, oh yeah, any large side, is that to use to determine if you I want to come or not. You understand what you think, right? But, like, if we truly believe, and I actually believe this, and so, like, I, I want to make a greater effort to, like, help other persons get to this point as well. Because if you like, really saying that all these things that we're preaching about and talking about at church, true, like, there will come a time where persons who aren't on the large side will die, right? And I want to make a point that I heard at 
one of our events tonight, we could prayer services. The guy was making the point that the commandment is made up of positives and negatives. So when the Bible, when the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, the negative side is you shouldn't kill somebody. Mm. The positive side of it is that you should be doing everything in your power to save somebody as well. Mm. Mm. So our work is, is, is the work of, of saving or helping in the work of saving souls. Yeah. Of course, the, the Holy Spirit does the inspiring. So they, they may not be happy with like the methods that we use because sometimes they're kind of cheesy and it don't work. But like where I can, where you can you make a difference, your own, you do your part. Uh, yeah. Uh, even if that's by being an example at like work or something, like how you interact with people, how you mm -hmm. treat people. If you're going to get a man the 20 dollars because you say you're hungry, you know? Um, so it's not, it's not just about going in the field and, and giving out. Well, sometimes that zones. could be even a like facade. You do that, you go in the field, and, you and then you go, back to, you, you go back to work. And as you said, you do saying like, nah, I ain't getting that boy $20. And so people look and be like, this is the same person Christian, that was out giving out the. So it's a, it's a constant Christianity and I've been a witness for God. It's, it's a, a lifestyle. Like, yeah, it's not yeah. just a. I feel like giving out the party the magazines is like a mindless task. It's it will, it will reach It will reach some people. But it won't reach all. That's the thing. Um, witnessing is not a one size fits all. Right. Uh, everyone, if you really truly believe in the things that we're talking about here, will have their own means of reaching to reaching out to exactly. somebody and aiding in their mm -hmm. rescue or whatever. Right. So it's determining. It's based on everyone now to determine what suits them best, mm -hmm. what they can do best to help like tell others about Jesus and mm -hmm. as a result get them on the, the, the winning the winning side yeah I just want to share something before we hopped on to the to the next session I was thinking about like when I was a lot younger and it's just the innocence of a child how it was like so last week funny <laughs> so so like I remember when I was younger I had just like I had gone to this crusade and as the crusade I actually got baptized at uh, I went to the evangelist after because I found, even though I was young, I used to ask a lot of questions. So I wouldn't really send out to something I didn't believe in. So I went and I asked my questions before I got baptized. And then I was so convicted by this thing. And I have very strong relationships I tell, with, with my um, teacher. I was in primary school and stuff. And I was like, wow, I want all my friends, my teachers to be saved. And, you know, after this preaching, I was like, I was genuinely concerned. I was like telling the preacher, I was like, you know, um, and I have uh, my friends, my teacher, they too would need to hear this message. And like, I just think back on the innocence of the ch as a child then, when you, you truly believe something, you know, this is good. You want everybody to get that. It fundamentally impacts you at your heart. You're like, shh. Man, I didn't want them to be lost. And I, you, you just do everything. And I was like, doing that. And I was like, shh. But I mean, the Bible talks about childlike faith, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, I just... If all of us could go back to that sort of childlike faith, we and we wholeheartedly <laughs> believe it, yeah, we, we move mountains. With God's help. That was, I just thought about that way I was discussing. I was like, wow. Like, me then versus kind of me. No, I'm still empowered um, to, to spread the gospel. It was just like thinking back on that was like, wow. At that age. Organize innocence. yourself, right? You know what you need to do. <laughs> so my, my thing is, going back to the question I was asking then, how do we make Jesus' victory our victory? How do we move that from a theoretical sense to a practical sense in our lives? Honestly, well, Lewin thinks because he's looking pensive. <laughs> I, um, it happened to me just this week, actually. I think yesterday. Um, it was, you know how they said there's no temptation that will befall you like God hasn't Jesus hasn't gone through. So I was, I literally had a temptation, so to speak. And usually sometimes, you know, we're just giving to them a feel bad after. I said, no, let me just actually pause and try something different. Because I was studying lesson two. And I said, God, I this all I did. It helped me to overcome this, to not feel dejected, to not feel this way. Because I already know you've won the victory. And it was like, I'm not even, I had like this jump start. So normally I would go into like a little dejected mood and stuff and, and just kind of shut off. And I just jump start and that was my most productive day. I get everything on my list done. And that was like the first time I really consciously sat down and said, let me claim that promise that, so to speak, of Jesus' own victory over temptation to myself. And I verbalized it. I said it. I prayed very brief. It wasn't like get on to a whole thing. And then it was just like, it worked for me. I mean, yes, it's a small issue, but if he could do it for me, he could do it for you, and he could do it in bigger things as well, too. And, and I don't know if you said in, in Hebrews 2.18, it said that because 
he himself suffered when he was tempted, he can also help us start being tempted. So because he went through it, as you said, mm -hmm. he can also aid us as we were going through it. And it's all about depending on him. So not trying to to, to bypass in ourselves or, or to voice in ourselves, but leaning on Jesus and, and getting through it. You came up with anything? Mm -mm. So I will, <laughs> I, will, I will add to what Saint Louis is still thinking. What I like to think as well about God is be a personal savior. Like yeah. you just said, you know, he himself suffered the things, but it is so personal. It's like, yes, he's a friend, he's a brother. He's more more than all that. He's a personal savior. So he would have come and he would have died for me. And the same way that I cried when I said, Lord, I'd be tempted is like, I was waiting for that call, Chelsea, just from you. Same way he would wait for one from you, from Jaron, et cetera. So it's like, I like to think of God as a very personal savior. He's concerned with the individual. He's concerned with the church as well, and the cooperative, but he's also concerned individually with you and i think that makes all the difference as well because his victory is that your victory you know when you're married you're like your husband's wins and your wins i don't know i'm not married i'm just saying uh, literally the concept of it is like you happy because so it's like this is your father this is your brother's your savior so it's like he's won and he didn't just win for himself he won for you and I think that's how I really make it because I see God as a very personal savior. All right, cool. So we assume you know that everybody at this table um, is married. No, no, no. <laughs> that we 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 believe that we on the same side as Jesus, and that we're convicted um, that He will win. All right, yeah. cool. My question is this: like, if Satan knows this as well, right? Because I feel like he may know this. Um, why, why is it that, why is it that he still continues to try to destroy Jesus or destroy his people? Like, what's your point? You know you're losing. So, so that's the thing. So I ain't trying to destroy Jesus because obviously I know he can't destroy Jesus. Right. But I can hurt with Jesus' love. Which is the point I was going to bring out the lesson. The lesson yes, brought that out. Here. So he can't defeat Christ. And he knows so I, that. I, I so it's like, what's the hurt. next best thing? I can hit you where it hurt. And, and the, the lesson itself literally said... Um, he's attempting to destroy the object of Christ's deepest affection, which is Christ's church. So his sole goal is to bring out as many people with him. Because it's like, all right, I realize I can't defeat Christ. You recognize that when Jesus prays for the grave and everything. But it's like, you hit the person next best where it hurts. Like in a saddle. And people have choices. So that's just like he had a choice to leave heaven. He knows followers of Christ have a choice he too. Reaching, yeah. So it's like, let me see how much of them I can get, you know? Like... If this is really the case, right? Um, let us think about it. Like, why would persons want to give in to Satan? Like, this is what the man out here doing, though. Like, the man literally show gases. He cares nothing about you. I and just doing this. I do this because I try because I spoke get my heart is my you know. But that's why I said it comes from belief and understanding. So belief is one part, but understanding. Like, do do people take the time to go through the word, understand first and foremost this whole origin story, and understand the character of both Christ and the character of Satan? Because you know sometimes we talk about Satan, yes, we talk about Satan's battle, whatever. But when Satan brings his sin, it don't seem to come across as bad as we sweet. It's something that you enjoy. Exactly. What he can tempt you with, he's not gonna tempt you um, with. He knows you like something, I like something else, draw like something else. So he's very strategic. So how he tries to get over is not like, it's not always, sometimes it may be, it's not like a big red flag, like, mm-mm. It's something like, man, and you just push in, push in the gray area, and you're like, ah, and you justifying it, and before you know it, he captures you. So it's like, you, he's literally like a prowling lion, um, as he will say. So it's like, you have to be aware of all the possible traps, you have to be aware of his character. It's, it's a really awareness thing. If you don't know, like, you're just out there like a deer in headlights. Like, like, just a thought of that, like, I feel like if we, ask, if we speak about this more in a more realistic way as a person, plain, a plain plainer, yeah, plainer way. It like, like you to convince people like, that that'll make no sense. Anything that people, even if they don't fully believe in the concept of the Bible or whatever, or not really into the whole church vibe and all that, like, there isn't, well, I personally can't really see, like, you logically dispelling this as something that don't make sense based on what Satan's doing, and so, to be something that you don't want a part of. True. True. Um, so mm. the, the lesson just talk about, as Charles said, the, he, he's trying to destroy the object 
of Christ's deepest affection, and it talks about the end time remnant. Who, who is this? Who is this remnant? <laughs> who is this remnant? So this remnant is supposed to be God's people in a nutshell. Um, these people got some. There are some characteristics. How much to characteristics? This grouping of people. A few, <laughs> but some of them are. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Some of them are, one, they keep the commandments of God. Um, especially, you know, not especially, but you know, we have Adventists. In, in particular. Yeah, yeah. We have Adventists going to say, you know, man. The fourth commandment. Right. But that's not just we. The that that's not just like we as Adventists. I feel like the reason we have to highlight that one is because in the last days, that's one of the commandments that will be under attack. Fundamentally, all the other commandments, for the most part, will be seen as morally incorrect. Thou shalt not murder. I, I mean, I don't know, but no, we can't. No, no, yeah, you're not going to be like, yeah, uh, you know, I'm mean, not doing that. There's not the purge. So, <laughs> so I feel like we've already seen how the fourth commandment has been manipulated by man. So to me, we're just going to see that get worse. That's one of the most... Uh, that's the one that is mainly being manipulated, I think. And that's the, why... The one that God says, remember, yeah. we somehow... Remember. We that's the thing. He doesn't say to, like, to his, remember. Remember means it has to already been, be known and instituted within you. So he's calling us to remember something that from basically creation has been there for us. And we're like... So the other ones were like, thou shalt not do this, da 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 This one is like, remember. But somehow we forget. There. Yeah, or you know, like... Uh, remember in the, in the sense of a Beijing. Yo, Jerome, remember to send me that money when you finish. You understand? Because you know that you can forget or that you probably exactly. already forget. Um, additionally, they hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. So whether that be the spirit of prophecy or other things, they stay true to that. Additionally... No, I, feel it, it. I believe no, it's two. That's why I asked you how much. You said a few. It's really to be a couple. Correct. A couple is two. Man's obviously not a scholar. It's two main things. So to be clear, the two main things are they keep God's commandments, which would be all ten, um, and they hold fast to their testimony with Jesus. And typically, what the testimony of Jesus is understood to be is the spirit of prophecy. And I know, like, there are different verses in the Bible, but like Acts two seventeen said. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Um, and then I know, I was looking up actually, when I was studying lesson, some of the other Adventist documentation we have on, on the testimony of Jesus. And they said, you know, this idea of this spirit of prophecy, it was for the sick. And I'm quoting from the Adventist reading. It was for the sake of safeguarding God's people against the great delusions of Satan in these last days that the testimony of Jesus was entrusted to them. So I guess it goes back to, to what you were asking about, like why will people like end up going missing if you know you don't care about him or anything like that? It's these delusions. So you need to have um, a remnant that not only keeps counts, but have this testimony of Jesus who's like being able to say, well, this is the truth. This is the light. Provide clarity. Yes, to provide that clarity. I mean, because the illusion is only going to get worse. Hmm. Like, I think about when listening to you speak about it just now, is that, you know, it can only talk about Adventists. We, we as Adventists, we speak these things all the time. I think we are at the point now where people aren't hearing us. Hmm. Um, but, like, for those of you watching, like, if you're Adventist, if you aren't Adventist, like, read these things for yourself. That's like, important. if you think that like, it's garbage, wait until you finish, that's okay. That is, they right? at least give it an opportunity. Yeah, give like... The, give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to work on you. Yeah, and I, I believe in, like, speaking from a position of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, like, I got this friend who was telling me that, you know, church is beer junk, Adventist, right? Or used to be Adventist. He really believed in what is he doing in the next and the third. So, it was like, what do they believe? What do Adventists believe? I ain't really sure. Couldn't give an answer. You know what I'm so I was like, all right, maybe I can believe this book. You're going to read it. This will help you understand like, what Adventists believe, right? After this, after reading this, if you still think that it's garbage, then I was fine, you know? At but least you're talking from you give it an opportunity. You're talking from a sense yeah, of knowledge. Yeah. And like, I wish, well, I guess by doing the podcast, more people may be um, impacted by this information or aware of it. But, like, I just wish that more persons would give it a chance. They don't necessarily have to believe it per se. But, but at, at least start by giving open, it a chance. Yeah, be open, open to, to it. receiving it. Yeah. Because it's like, 
that clarity that you are that you mentioned, Chelsea, and you just magically yeah, fall down from the sky, or you you like you just turn on a million night and then everything just becomes clear. Like you kind of go like take study. Yeah, you study it. Study seven, you gotta study seven. Gotta study seven, exactly. Yeah. I guess we should have like a disclaimer or tagline, which I think is really important, is that even though you may tune in and listen to these podcasts, it's not really for you to the podcast is to encourage you, I should put it this way, to go and read the Bible for yourself. Not only just the lesson, the actual Bible, because sometimes we read the lesson. Um, I think, you know, that's enough, but actually go into the Bible and read it for yourself. And that's something I started doing this year. Um, I read the actual Bible chapter by chapter. I take my time. I'm going on to know Exodus. That's how slow I am. But no, but I actually do like a deep study and take notes and everything. That's, that's very But good. Um, what I found and what puts me to this position is you can't rely on pastors. And this is not. Um, this and pastors, anything, they will say the same. You can't rely on pastors or people or even listen to podcasts to necessarily give you your conviction. Your conviction can only come from the Holy Spirit transforming or working within you. And to know Jesus, you have to spend time with him. I, there's multiple ways. Yes, you go to church, you have the fellowship, but ultimately you need to have that one-on-one -on -one time with God where exactly. you sit down, you read the Bible and learn about his character. There's so much. The entire Bible points to God's character, even the books we think that are boring, which is what I've been finding out. Um... And also pray and speak to God. So I think that that's a big takeaway. Like, yes, it's good to sign on. It's good to watch these and learn uh, from the podcast and from pastors and deeply or not. But you have to make the conscious effort, as both of y'all said, to pick up the Bible and actually just start. Just pick a book and start. That's what I had to do. I just had to pick a book and start. Yeah, fair enough. I can just be that guy and say it at the time. I'll be a lot of the podcast recording is pretty much gone. <laughs> yeah, so. so we should wrap it up. So Revelation 12 gives us this, this nutshell and a background about how it all started and really and truly how it's going to end. And it started with this idea of choice, right? And we too have a choice to make. Um, Earth's last war is not centered on Russia and Ukraine or somewhere out in the Middle East. It's this war that is going on between God and Satan, essentially for our hearts. So essentially the question is who has our loyalty? Where is our allegiance? And God wants people that are charmed by Christ's love, redeemed by his grace, committed to his purpose, and empowered by his spirit, and so obedient to his commands that they are willing to face death itself for his cause. Our world is headed for a major crisis, but in Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus, and because of Jesus, our victory is assured, just as long as we stay connected to him. Uh, which we do by faith, and the faith that leads us to obedience. And it all comes down to choice. And to add my little, my little thing in the end, um, Deuteronomy 30, when Moses said, you know, I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Choose life so that you will live. Um, the fact that we go and tell people to choose it, Louis. Like. <laughs> it's because it's a choice, Louis. It's a choice. We, we spent this whole forty minutes talking about a choice. Did that one slip you? No, no. It's a I just, choice. I'm just saying, like, you don't choose to breathe. Like, it's something that you need. You well, you can understand? choose not to. You can choose, you can not, choose not to breathe. Hold your breath. You can hold your breath. Point. There, are, there are consequences. Point. But you can choose not to. I understand breathe. what you're saying. That our choice should be. As nat our choice to choose Jesus and to choose love should be as natural as breathing. I think that's what you want to see. Well, that's well, your tagline. Well said. Yes, there, um, there we go. I just want to add into the... We ain't trying to convince you to choose Jesus per se. We present to yes, you. We are. Well, fine. we are. We are. I, I feel like we're also encouraging are, you. We're encouraging you. Okay, fine. Yes, Take we my are. Side. We are. I, I will say, we present to you with options. Options. Is and we are telling you that the that right this option makes sense. is this is, is right. Jesus. However, ultimately, it's up to you. Yours. It's your choice. Um, I feel on that note. We can. Yes, we can pray. We can pray for us to make the right choice and for anybody viewing as well to also make the right choice. Because I didn't have the pastor pray after that, that little ending that you put on there, Justin. Over to you. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this lesson that you've given us. A lesson where you reminded us that, yes, we have a choice, but ultimately the right choice is you. We pray that for us here, 
and for even those are list who are listening will will choose you in the end choose you before it's too late bless us bless us as we go through this sabbath and i pray that as we continue to study sabbath we'll be more inspired by your word so that we can live for you in jesus name i pray amen, amen. so thank you for joining us this week on study seven uh, we look forward to seeing you next Friday evening as we look to lesson two. And what's the title of lesson two, Chelsea? A moment of destiny. Yeah. You read it already? I started. Oh, fair enough. Well, I'm ready. Good stuff, good stuff. I glanced at it. Happy yeah. Sabbath and God bless. Happy Sabbath.